Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Today is Sunday, October the 28th, 2018. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about Danny Jacobs' victory over Sergei Derevianchenko. Let me just say it's a total loss for me. My pre-fight uh, suggested play was the underdog, the plus 175 underdog, Derevianchenko, to win the fight, to beat Danny Jacobs, hedged with Jacobs by KO. Now, before I go further, let me just say it's very important in moments like this that we take a look outside the uh, fighters and acknowledge guys who are doing great work in the sport of boxing. Understand this really was an Andre Rosier fight. He's one of New York City's best trainers. You saw his work on both sides of the match. Danny Jacobs is brilliance back foot game. He goes southpaw. We'll talk about that. And Derevianchenko's brilliance, right? He came back big time in this fight, folks. Understand it was a split decision. He almost pulled it off. If he just had another round, he may well have. In fact, I thought in the 11th round, and keep in mind, by then he's winning a lot of rounds. In the 11th round, he's on a roll. And it's a straight right hand from Danny Jacobs about midway through that round that derails Derevianchenko, right? Derails him. Might have given Danny Jacobs the round, right? Big turning point in the fight. Well, let me just say, understand, Andre Rosier trains both men. The excellence you saw in both corners comes from the same trainer, who's also trained others, Saddam Ali, Curtis Stevens, right? This guy is one of boxing's best trainers. It would be malpractice on my part not to acknowledge his work in this fight between two of his fighters. Let me also say, too, he was in the corner of Danny Jacobs for this fight. So the comments in the corner, in the Derevianchenko corner, right, understand, <laughs> were comments made by one of his associates who helps him train the fighter, who helps him train Danny Jacobs. So when in Derevianchenko's corner, they're saying, look, you need to keep backing him up. Understand that's an observation being made by someone in Danny Jacobs' camp. That's the blueprint that Jacobs' own people feel would be effective against him, right? Anytime you have head trainer in one corner and junior trainer in the other corner, you need to make notes because that's a special insight into what the fighter's own camp feels are the fighters flaws now let me say this too right um, it's at moments like this that you need to write down in your notes and every gambler needs notes right every gambler needs notes you need to write down in your notes the fact that Derevianchenko who lost this fight I thought he lost this fight, and I was rooting for him to win the fight, right? But I thought the fight was very close, very close. That 11th round changed it for me. But you need to write down the fact that this guy is going to be a live underdog in any fight he has against anyone at middleweight, anyone at middleweight against whom he's an underdog. I don't care if it's Golovkin. I don't care if it's Canelo. I don't care if it's Charlo. Right? This guy's hard level. He's high level. Let me just say this, and I don't say it lightly. 
He gave Danny Jacobs one of the best fights we've seen anyone give Danny Jacobs. Right? Anyone. Now, I disagreed with Harold Letterman's scoring on the HBO telecast. Right? Understand there are many people in the public who may have heard Letterman giving a lot of the early rounds to Danny Jacobs, who may feel that Jacobs just beat, you know, another opponent. Right? What I want you to do is to look at the fight closely. It's a chess match. It's a high-level chess match. Let me just say this. This is one of the best fights we're going to see this year. Danny Jacobs just gave you a masterpiece performance. Folks, it's, it's really a masterpiece. By that I mean he had to change strategy in the middle of the fight. Right? After getting hurt earlier in the fight. Now, stylistically, let's talk about why he won. And I think it's a simple reason. Derevianchenko has a very good left hook. I know on the telecast, Roy Jones is criticizing his left hook. What I want people to understand is that Roy Jones had one of the best left hooks in recent boxing history. Go back and look at Roy Jones Jr. against Vinny Pazienza. Right? Roy Jones, before one fight, actually showed up wearing a Captain Hook outfit. Right? Because Jones knew he had a great left hook. Right? Roy Jones has the best left hook in his fight against Felix Trinidad. People forget that fight. Jones won it convincingly. Right? Came back in the fight to win it. Gives away the early rounds. Now understand, Jones' left hook is like Floyd Mayweather's left hook. For a great left hook Floyd Mayweather fight, look at his fight against Diego Corrales. Right? These guys have ring coverage, what I call ring coverage, on their left hook. In other words, they can be far away from you. Right? Again, Jones, Pazienza, that fight. Mayweather, Corrales, that fight. They could be far away from you. And then they spring with a left hook that they could throw from distance. It's important because their opponent then has to always be mindful of the left hook, right? Even when they're from distance. Now in this fight, early, second round, it's a pivotal round, folks. Danny Jacobs, first let me say this. Derevianchenko gets dropped in the first round. It's a high right hand off the side of his head. He gets dropped. I want you to see him at the beginning of the second round. He's in against a puncher who's just dropped him. A man he knows well, a man against whom he's sparred 300 plus rounds. Right? He comes out in the second round. Folks, you know who he is. At the start of the second round, when right after getting knocked down late in the first round, he's on his front foot against Danny Jacobs. In other words, this is his shot at a title. Okay, I got knocked down in the first round. All right, I'm going to go out here on my sword. This guy is going to get my A game. Right? I was just on the canvas first time in his pro career. There is no thought of running away. There is no thought of trying to hide from Danny Jacobs. No, he comes out in the second round and he's looking for Danny Jacobs. He's looking for Danny. He then starts roughing up Danny. You know the mindset. Okay, you caught me the first round. I'm going to even this up right here. Right? You know the mindset. So he hurts Danny. Hurts him. Danny looks hurt bad to me. Then Danny Jacobs, as only a great fighter can do. Only a fighter with elite level skills can do. Danny Jacobs, who knows his sparring partner, 
Danny Jacobs goes southpaw. Now he's able to do it because, as Roy Jones points out on the telecast, he understands that from a certain distance, Derevianchenko can't land his left hook on him. Right? He can't. So Jacobs changes the angles, goes from righty to lefty. And as Jones puts it in the telecast, where all he has to worry about, since the Revianchenko can't land his left hook from distance, right? Roy just says he can't land his left hook. We find out later in this fight he has an excellent left hook. It's just an up-close left hook, right? Because he can't land the left hook from distance, because he's not Miguel Cotto. Guy who could hit you, had ring coverage on his left hook, right? Because he's not Miguel Cotto. When Danny Jacobs goes to Southpaw by necessity because he's been hurt in an orthodox stance, all he has to look out for is the Revianchenko's straight right hand. In other words, Danny keeps him outside with a jab. Right? The spacing's crucial in this fight because up close, where Derevianchenko gets later, he's able to land hooks. But early on, Danny's able to keep him outside with a jab. So he knows he can't land the left hook from outside. All I have to worry about is a straight right hand from outside at this angle. Now that carries Danny early in the fight. It costs him later in the fight because he's not able to keep Derevianchenko on the outside. Let me say this too. I thought it was interesting. Right? Derevianchenko's corner says keep backing him up. They obviously believe the way to beat Danny Jacobs is to be on your front foot. Right? Let me say too. Derevianchenko is slick with it. He's on his front foot, but there are times where he's fainting coming forward. Read the feints. This is an elite fighter. He just happened to be facing another elite fighter who knew him well and who understood that he didn't have a lot of ring coverage on that left hook. When he gets up close, that left hook's a weapon. But against a guy with a great jab, who's ambidextrous, who can also hit you with a jab from a southpaw stance. He couldn't get in the position that he needed to get. So what you need to ask yourself is how many guys are like Danny Jacobs at middleweight? How many guys have length? Jacobs is tall, has a great long jab, right? His jab, to be fair, is better from an orthodox stance than it is from a southpaw stance, but he has a jab from a southpaw stance, right? How many guys are like Jacobs at middleweight right now in reference to Derevianchenko, right? A guy who's actually sparred with Derevianchenko 300 rounds. And I would say there's only one, Danny Jacobs, right? So you need in your betting notebook right here to write down this fighter's name because he just lost a split decision as a plus 175 underdog to Danny Jacobs right and I'm just telling you I know there are going to be a lot of fans there who heard HBO giving a lot of rounds to Danny Jacobs I know there are going to be a lot of people out there who like me at times has problems sometimes pronouncing his name Right? That matters when it comes to perception and stuff. Right? I know there are going to be a lot of guys out there, a lot of people. In fact, let me stop being sexist here. A lot of sports fans, men and women, right, who are going to undervalue this guy. This guy should not be undervalued. He's a hell of a fighter. Right? If he doesn't get caught in that 11th round and slowed down, I would have had him winning this fight. 
right? I just thought it was a unique set of circumstances where he happened to be facing a guy who knew him well. In other words, Jacobs doesn't have a learning curve. As soon as Jacobs gets hurt, and he gets hurt, folks, look at that second round. I'll name the round. He gets hurt in the second round. As soon as he gets hurt, he knew to go southpaw. That was his strategy. He knew to go southpaw because he knew that his sparring partner didn't have a long left hook. Right? He knew the hook wasn't what I call hair trigger. Right? Substitute the word quick for here. He knew that the Revianchenko's left hook isn't a quick long left hook. He wasn't facing the Floyd who fought Diego Corrales. Right? He, he wasn't facing the Miguel Cotto who fought Sergio Martinez. Another great left hook. The guy could lunge in with it. He was fighting a guy who needed to get deeper in the pocket to land that left hook. Right? Against a fighter with a learning curve, who gets hurt, who's seeing stars, who isn't able to think clearly, who isn't as familiar with the tools in the Revianchenko's toolkit, the Revianchenko might have closed the show. Let me say too, in terms of scoring, I know people are going to be heavily impacted by Max Kellerman. Understand he's not the only person on the HBO telecast. What I want you to do is to focus on Max Kellerman's comments. Right? Kellerman's diplomatic. But when they go to his uh, cohort, Harold Letterman's scorecard. And Letterman at one point says he has Jacobs pulling away, winning four rounds in a row. Kellerman, while supporting HBO as a unit, politely says, hey, uh, <laughs> a lot of people are going to have this as a closer fight, a one or two round fight, something like that. Right? Kellerman knew what he was watching was a live underdog. He knows that early. Right? Now, this fight blew up on me, so it goes. But I will just say that I was impressed with the Revianchenko. Right? This is one of those experiences, this is my own learning curve, where I'm writing down that he gave Danny Jacobs a hell of a fight, a split decision outcome. That this guy is better than advertised. But what we learned in this fight was that Danny Jacobs is also better than advertised. I congratulate Danny Jacobs. I had him winning the fight. I thought I thought Sergi was closing fast. But I thought just like Jacobs recovered in round two, I thought Jacobs recovered in round eleven. Right? That's straight. Jacobs hits hard. He lands a very solid shot in round 11. Um, it's only because Derevianchenko is one of these boxers who you hit him hard, he's hurt, but he's bluffing. Right? He's trying to look, you know, like it didn't hurt him, even though you notice his coordination isn't quite there. Right? You know, the fight's taken out of him long enough for him to lose the round. It's only because of Jacobs' punching power that we have the outcome that we have. I congratulate both fighters, and I also congratulate their trainer on a job well done, and that's Andre Rosier. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.